What's going on everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Crypto Catch Up with me, Benny. Now today we're going to be doing a video on Merkle Trees and Patricia Tries. Now they are two different things, but they relate to two different blockchains and this has come from the community from Crypto Australia over in the right hand side. So what we want to talk about is really why they're enabling global truth in blockchains and why they're actually such a fundamental part of every block. So let's get into it. All right, well, Merkle trees also have other names that you might hear around the place. So they might be called hash trees, or they might also be called a binary hash tree. Now, these were actually created or invented as such by a gentleman by the name of Ralph Merkel, who painted it in 1979, and he was a computer scientist. So uh, he's actually been quite prolific in this space, in cryptography and a range of other areas, uh, which has led to obviously the Merkle tree, hence his surname there. Now, what are the properties that make up a Merkle tree? Because obviously the name of it's something that we just go, whoa, what the hell, what is a Merkle tree? Well, one, obviously the name comes from Ralph Merkle, but the tree portion, let's get into that. Well, essentially what they are, are data structures. They allow us as individuals or computers to verify the contents of something. So in Bitcoin, it's to verify that transactions existed that they happened at a particular time, that they were a part of a particular block. This could also be used in other systems, which we'll go into shortly. They're tamper-proof because of the way that they use cryptographic hashing, which is why I've done a video uh, on hashing and, and cryptographic hash functions prior to this to enable you to go back and have a look at that and then come and watch this video. So it makes a little bit more sense for you because the Merkle tree is made up of hashing two different things together. It's computationally efficient. So if you could imagine the thousands of transactions that go on on the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, every 10 minutes, we can't store that information all the time, especially as we continue to go on into the future. We're going to start using, obviously, a lot more information and a lot more transactions as global adoption comes to the forefront. So it needed to be something that allows us to verify it, that's tamper proof, but also is small in storage space. It enables verification without sending all the transactions and all the blocks. And that's done within the block header. So the block header has five things uh, specifically to Bitcoin in this circumstance. It has the hash, a timestamp, uh, a mining difficulty value. And what I might add is that the hash is of the previous block. And that really is to do with ordering of the blocks, more of a, a timing scenario. Uh, the proof of work nounce, which is like a, a number that they must find, uh, and a root hash for the Merkle tree. Now that's where everyone goes, a root hash of the Merkle tree. Well, don't worry, we're about to get into it. It's heavily used in SPV, which was actually uh, detailed by Satoshi in the original white paper in 2008. And SPV stands for Simple Payment Verification. Because if you can imagine, like we've just talked about, about being computationally efficient, if I'm running a mobile app or I'm a merchant, I'm not going to go and download the Bitcoin blockchain, which is 163 gig, as of March 2018, especially when we consider projects like Bitcoin Cash, which are trying to use one terabyte blocks, which is larger than the whole Bitcoin chain right now in one block. It simply is not feasible. And then we start talking about centralization of the services because you and I can't participate in a network that is so expensive to run like that in terms of storage space and the integrity of the data. So it essentially protects the transactions within Bitcoin. And we know then if somebody's tried to tamper with it. So what are some of the use cases? Well, of course they're used in blockchains. That's why we're here, right? They're also used in IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, which I'll do a video on shortly. Uh, and it's quite cool. It's actually file storage in a decentralized manner. And the way that it was actually designed was thinking about, well, one day if we live on the moon, 
how are we going to store this data in a particular way that is going to make it easy for us to verify, but also to send back and forth. And finally, even in enterprise grade products like Apache Cassandra, which is a no SQL database, uh, it's open source and that thing flies. That is a really fast database, unlike Bitcoin. So let's give it a bit of a definition here. Well, like I said, it is just a data structure, but let's explain the tree concept. Now, this is gobbledygook, but we're gonna go through it together. So it's a tree, which every leaf node is labeled. Now, a leaf node in this circumstance is just data. It's a transaction with the hash of a data block. Once again, that transaction that I've just talked about and every non-leaf node. So anything that's not just the outer, the outer being or the outer leaves, anything that's not that is labeled with the cryptographic hash of the labels of its child nodes. What? All right. This is is an example. So what we've got down the bottom here, and I'll get this and see if this works. So all the information along the bottom here, what they're calling data blocks up in this here, data block, they're called the leaf nodes. They are simply transactions. So one transaction, Alice to Bob, Bob to Ben, Ben to Samsung, Samsung to Apple, who cares? But essentially what happens in a Merkle tree is that we take these two transactions, and we hash them together. And by hashing them together, what we do is take that cryptographic hash function, the SHA-256 in Bitcoin's case, and we get a singular output. And then we hash this to this, and we get the root. So obviously in this circumstance, there's only four transactions, and in a Bitcoin block, you know, you might have 2,500 transactions. So this is a very simplistic use case, but it's just about the key terminology. And that key terminology is simply leafs, which is data, branches, which is anything that is not data and not the root, and the root, which is the final outcome. And what this allows us to do, and what I've put over here is that, you know, why a tree? Well, we now know what Merkle is in terms of the name. Well. This is a tree, look at it. It's using leaves and branches and a root and the root is that innermost part. And by using cryptographic hashes, what we can do here is that if this here, this particular transaction or which came from here was ever changed, then this hash will change and this hash will change because we've seen that in the hash functions. When you input something, it should be deterministic. So you input something and it should render the same outcome if that same input information is put in every time. So what about if we were to just hash it all together? Why do we need branches? Why do we need leaves or anything like that? This is true and some people argue that uh, on Bitcoin it's unnecessary to do that. You should just be able to hash it all together. But like I talked about is that if you want to do what is known as a Merkle proof, and prove that you know transaction four here actually ever occurred, it enables you to just query this branch here. It means you don't have to download every bit of information, which is obviously computationally a lot easier to do, especially for something like a mobile phone, which is what SPV wallets do. They ask for Merkle proofs. If a merchant goes, has a double spent, let's get the proof. They update and they verify if anything is changed and boom, there is the answer. The downside to a Merkle tree, however, is that it only gives you a record of transactions. It doesn't, you know, let you know how much BTC, for example, that particular account had at any one time, which is what we're going to get into with Ethereum shortly. But before we do that, I want to really drill home what it means to use a cryptographic hash and to have that Merkle hash function. So what we're gonna do here is once this loads, get out of that. So what we've grabbed on the right hand side is a block back from 2014, as you can see here. It's got 99 transactions in it, which you can see down the left hand side here. And what I've taken is from this gentleman, Ken Sheriff's blog, uh, if you want, so go to Rito.com. 
He's written this lovely piece of Python code. Now, of course, we're not going to go through that, but what I want to show you is how this Merkle root actually works using the SHA-256 algorithm that Bitcoin uses. So if we compare this here, 00BAF, 00BAF, you know, 28B, 28B, 91C, DEA, 91C, DEA, and we go down and we've got all 99 transactions in here. And what this code essentially is doing here is taking a list, it hashes two together, which is done in this function here. Uh, and you'll see here that it uses the SHA-256 from this hash library. Now, let's have a look. We execute it, execute it, and we get 878A. Okay, well, that's cool, but let's see the magic of SHA-256. Like I said, if we have the same input, it's deterministic, it should get the same output every time. Let's run it again, same thing. Run it again, same thing. But this is where the cryptographic hash function comes in, and what I was talking about where we was, you know, for example, if we were to go back and change one of these particular transactions, what might happen? Well... Let's find out. Da, da, da. Let's change C here to D. One little integer, uh, sorry, char of all of these transaction hashes. Wow, that changed. So if we change this back to C, if we click up here again, change this back to C, will it go back? to the hash that we had before or, or that Merkle root. Yes, it does. And that is a beauty, ladies and gentlemen, of cryptographic hash functions. So if anybody ever tried to fudge any of these transactions after they occurred, we know that within the actual, uh, you know, Merkle root of each block, which is here, the Merkle root, which is made up of these transactions, if anyone tried to fudge this here, this Merkle root is referred to within this next block, we would know that something funny has happened and what the software would do of these miners or the, the nodes or the SPV wallets like your mobile phone like we talked about, they would simply reject. They would go, wait a minute, no, no, no. This transaction, something funky's happened here. And obviously we can do something about it from there on. So what's next? Well. That seems pretty simple. It's just a tree where we hash data together, which allows us to query that data in that data structure. But what about Ethereum? Well, Ethereum is very different to Bitcoin. Bitcoin just has those transactions. Ethereum is a global computer. And because it's a global computer, there's a lot of things changing at any one time. Because when a transaction occurs and it's you know, written into a block on Bitcoin, it's kind of frozen in that state forever. Whereas Ethereum, it has smart contracts and smart contracts are updating all the time. So what Ethereum uses is actually called a Merkle Patricia try, or what's also known as a Radix try. Now, Ethereum, instead of using one Merkle tree, it uses three different Merkles to be able to achieve that global state and to have some form of, you know, extra ability to query data within their particular blockchain. So they have a state root, which is essentially the state of the block, the transaction root, that one's fairly self-explanatory, and you have the receipts root. Now the receipts root is something like your gas used, uh, things like that. Uh, your state um, root, if I go back up, is things like your accounts. You know, you can have an account because Ethereum is an account based system um, rather than what you have in Bitcoin, um, which only has a UTXO, so the unspent transaction outputs. Now, Patricia actually stands for something. So Patricia stands for practical algorithm to retrieve information coded in alphanumeric. So when you look at the Merkle Patricia try, Patricia actually has some form of, you know, acronym that goes with it. Now, if we were to look at the Ethereum, uh, you know, tree or the try, 
it's obviously a lot more complex here, guys, and that's what I'm showing here. Uh, this is a modified Merkel Patricia Tri system, uh, and on the right hand side, we have a simplified world state. So if we look at this first one, A711355, there should be 45 ETH in that particular account. Well, let's have a look. Well, there it is, A7 from the root. We go down, we go to 1. There was another one in a 355. Ah, there it is on the leaf node. 1355. 45 ETH in there. The next one you see, if we go up, we got 40, uh, sorry, A77D337, one we in there. A7, we go, ooh, where's the 7? Oh, 7's here. D3, okay, 37. Where's that? 37. Right. Now, this is obviously much more complex, and I don't really want to go into it much more with you, but if you are interested, please have a look at the yellow paper from Ethereum. What it's more so important to understand is that these Merkle trees are used to obviously show some form of verification, some form of tamper-proofing, uh, and that they're computationally light, so we can if something is verified or need to verify something, we can do that without having to recompute the whole Merkle root. This is another picture and just some example questions. So rather than going, has this transaction occurred? On the left hand side, you know, has this transaction been included in a particular block? Well, yes, we would check the transaction tree for that. What is the current balance of my account? This is something that Bitcoin can't do. That is stored within the receipt tree. Does this account even exist? That's in the state tree. And, you know, can we pretend to run this transaction? So some form of, um, you know, automation, you, you're wanting to test something. What that actually does is a little bit different. It's like a Merkle proof, uh, but, but slightly different. Uh, and it enables them to spool up a SPV node uh, and essentially check that by using a state tree. But we're right at the end, guys, and everyone's going, DAGs, you know, what about IOTA? What about all the rest of them? Well, DAGs, they have their own Merkle DAG because in most DAGs, they are even. So what I've drawn up here just quickly is an uneven one and what that actually happens. So you've got these two that hash, these two that hash together, and then you've got this poor little bugger on to the side. And in the Bitcoin SHA-256 program that we ran before, this will actually double hash on itself and we move up and then it joins together and then we get that there because DAGs obviously don't have that kind of ordering of blocks the same as what Bitcoin or Ethereum does in a standardized blockchain. They are a directed acyclic graph, which is something that's been around for a long time, but obviously being used right now in the you know distributed ledger space so i won't go any further into that guys but that is all so that is merkle trees and patricia tries the learnings from that guys is obviously bitcoin has one they use it they're actually computationally not as efficient as they could be because they do a double hashing that's something that satoshi did um that obviously bitcoin uh, sorry ethereum also uses it but ethereum has a different way of handling it because it is not just transactions. All right, guys, that is all. Once again, if you have any queries, uh, questions, or, or doubtful points, let them know below. Please make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you soon.